Hello, you're listening to the Drawing the Ideal Self podcast for February 2023. For today's podcast, I thought I would do something a little bit different. I've got a book called Dorothy Rowe's Guide to Life, and you might know Dorothy Rowe better as the most famous author for a popular book on depression. So Rowe was a clinical psychologist um, from Australia, and she worked both as a teacher and a child psychologist before she came to the UK, and she did a PhD here. Then she worked in Lincolnshire and became basically a writer, communicating PCP ideas without even saying it's PCP. So she's very famous for writing something in a very accessible way. I thought what I would do today is read you a chapter from one of her books. The book is called Dorothy Rowe's Guide to Life. And now it's quite uh, an old book because it's from the 1990s. However, I think it's just as good as it was at the time. She said of PCP, I found that PCP was the first and only kind of psychological theory which actually related to real human beings. So the chapter I'm going to read is called Life, What You Can't Change and What You Can. When you think about your life, do you feel that you are as you are? The world is as you see it. Your past was what it was. Your present is what it is. And your future will be very much what you expect it to be. Do you feel that although some parts of you, your life and the world can change, you, your life and the world are in essence fixed? Do you feel that you are as you are, your life is what it is and the world is what it is? Do you feel that in knowing yourself, your life and the world, you know what reality is? Do you feel that you, your life and the world are your fixed, unalterable fate? They are as they are. They are your lot. They are your reality. If this is what you feel, then you are mistaken. You, your life and the world are not fixed, unalterable parts of reality, which you have to put up with and cope with as best you can. What you see as being you, your life and the world, is not reality. You, your life and the world, are matters that you can change. What you see as you, your life and the world, are the set of conclusions you have drawn from your experience of life, which began when you were a tiny babe, tucked in your mum's womb, and your growing brain, like the hardware of a computer, got to the stage where it could run your software, commonly called your mind, or less commonly, your meaning structure. To describe what I mean by a meaning structure, I have used the analogy of a computer. But this is quite inadequate because our brains can do much more than the most advanced computer can. A computer's hardware is built and then the software, which someone has constructed separately, is fed into it. Whereas our hardware and the software of a brain develop together. Our brains come equipped with much more than what can be observed when a brain is dissected or scanned. Our brains come equipped with tools which are there as potentialities until our interaction with the environment brings that potential into use. Thus, before the potential of your tool of language could come into being and be used, you had to have a language spoken around you and you had to be able to hear it. Clever though these tools are, their function is not to reveal reality to you. They are not transparent windows onto the world. Instead, the tool's function is to create a construction which represents some aspect of your experience. This construction is a meaning. If the language you learn to speak is English, you'll see the world in the way English creates it. If you learn Latin or Spanish or Italian, or were born in the West Indies, you'll see the world differently. A study of the derivation of words will show just how diversely different languages see the world. The word dawn comes from the Old English, deg, day, and dagen 
to become light. Ancient Romans saw dawns where the air grows golden, hence aura from aurum, gold. Spaniards and Italians saw white dawn, alba, the white. Out of African languages, dawn in the West Indies becomes day clean and cockcrow, gimme trousers. When, shortly after birth, your eyes open, you seem to be surrounded by a blur of events. Then one of your tools comes into operation, the tool of contrast. With this tool, some parts of the blur look different from other parts. You start to see patterns. For the rest of your life, you will continue to see patterns, even when no patterns actually exist. You'll hear patterns and learn to call the clearly constructed patterns you hear language or music and the less clearly structured noise. You'll learn to feel patterns, taste patterns and smell patterns. Within a day or so, one of these patterns, which you see, becomes very significant, though as yet you don't know why. Your tool of face recognition has come into operation. And a few days later, you know, though you haven't the words to say it, that's my mum. Aren't you clever? That's because the function of your brain is to create meaning. You could ask, isn't the function of the brain to keep the body alive? I would say, this is the meaning for the brain, which many people now use because this meaning seems to give useful results. But it's only recently in human history that the brain has been given this meaning. In other times and cultures, organs of the body, the heart, the stomach and the bowels, have been given the meaning of being the most important organ. Current research on genes and DNA suggests it's our genes that have the primary importance. No doubt there are genes which enable our brains to create meaning. At the moment of conception, the brain starts developing and at some point, current research suggests about 18 weeks gestation, meaning starts to be created. Note that I did not say you start creating meaning. There is no you sitting inside your brain creating meaning. Or at least I hope there isn't, because then I'd have to work out how little you inside your brain creates meaning, and if little you has a littler you inside, and so on and so on, to an infinity of yous. So let's stick with your brain creating meaning. Now I'm going to abandon the computer metaphor and turn to Lego. For those of you bereft of children, I shall explain that Lego is a toy made up of plastic blocks of all shapes and sizes, but all with a regular pattern of circular indentations and raised rings. The rings of one block fit into the indentations of another, thus allowing all sorts of structures to be built. However, if you imagine your brain being made of blocks of Lego, the difference would be that this brain Lego is infinitely flexible so that every part can be attached simultaneously to every other and can reform itself to accommodate any new part that arrives on the scene. This happens often because your Lego brain has many tools which, sometimes working together and sometimes working alone, create new pieces of Lego. Each piece of Lego is a meaning. Your first piece of Lego meaning, formed at some point after conception, probably had to do with pleasure and pain. Soon would follow Lego meanings to do with sounds and pressure, and these would all link together. Ease of pressure would link to pleasure, harsh sounds to pain. The linked pieces of Lego meaning form a structure. Hence the term meaning structure. This meaning structure constantly accommodates new pieces of Lego meaning and reforms itself in the process. Encountering the outside world brings a constant, never-ending influx of changes. And at some point, the meaning structure starts to call itself I. You are your meaning structure. Your meaning structure is you. If you like, you don't have to think of yourself as a set of flexible Lego. 
perhaps you could think of another metaphor. A cell dividing and enlarging, with each new cell being a meaning, is another image I sometimes use. One of our greatest problems is that the only way we can make sense of anything is in terms of our current meaning structure. We understand something new by seeing it as like something we already know about. Whenever we encounter something which actually is so new to us that there is nothing in our meaning structure like it, we find it hard to make sense of it. That is why keeping up with modern physics is so difficult. It is hard to imagine images like black holes and alternative universes. And even these images are likely to be quite inadequate in describing what is actually out there, because the physicists have to rely on using images that already exist. I use the Lego image as a way of explaining, first, what all of us do all the time is to create meaning, and second, that these meanings hang together and add up to an understanding of what we are, life, the world is. The fact that you are in essence a meaning creating creature is what you are stuck with and cannot change. You cannot change the basic physical constituents of your body. You cannot grow wings and fly. You are a non-flying creature, but you are a meaning creating creature. Your brain hardware can grow or suffer injury and decay, and your meaning structure constantly changes. But there are some constituents of your being that you cannot leave them. You can imagine leaving your body, but this is just one of the amazing tricks your meaning structure can play. Your meaning structure cannot show you what reality is. All your meaning structure can show you are pictures which represent what you think reality is. These pictures are actually inside your head. But your amazing brain and meaning structure persuade you that you are inside the pictures and that what you picture is real. Presumably, some kind of reality outside ourselves exists. Some philosophers have argued that all that exists are our thoughts. But that seems nonsensical. Am I just imagining the paper I'm writing on? And are you just imagining the book you're reading? I'm sure that if you and I had simply imagined the universe and everything in it, we wouldn't have created the terrible things that happen in the world. The evidence from our experience does seem to point to the existence of reality, the total sum of everything that exists. What this everything is, is something we human beings can never know directly. We can only know it indirectly through careful judgment and thought. Physicists talk about everything that exists being made up of tiny particles which they give curious names like neutrino, charm and quark. To large parts of everything that exists they give names like galaxy, nebula, solar systems and black holes. They talk about these things as if they are reality. But when pressed, physicists will explain that they cannot possibly see reality. Erwin Schrödinger wrote the world is a construct of our sensations, perceptions, memories. It is convenient to regard it as existing objectively on its own, but it certainly does not become manifest by its mere existence. Its becoming manifest is conditional on very special goings-on in very special parts of the world, namely on certain events that happen in a brain. We all make different kinds of observations. But these observations depend on where we are and what we expect to see. What we see and report is not reality, but our interpretation of reality. This is all that any of us can do. We can never know reality directly. All we can ever know is our interpretations of reality. What you know as you, your life and the world is not reality. What you know as you, yourself and the world is your interpretation of you your life and the world. Seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, tasting are always, even at their very simplest, interpretations. Just as intuitions are interpretations, interpretations are meanings. We are always in the business of creating meanings. This is what you cannot change. You cannot not create meaning. 
Imagine you're sitting quietly in your room and something happens. Your awareness of this happening is your interpretation. The beginning of your interpretation, entirely without words, is, say, a very loud sound. Immediately, before you stir from your seat to find out why the loud sound occurred, you give the sound a meaning. You might think it was an explosion, or a car crash, or a breaking window and so on. After interpreting the sound, you might decide to check whether you were right. You don't have to be conscious to create meaning. Even fast asleep, you interpret what is happening as being in your body. And you move to release your trapped arm, all without you waking. It is our interpretations which determine how we think, feel and act. Thus, it's not what happens to you that matters, but how you interpret what happens to you. You always have a choice about how you will interpret what happens to you. This applies even in the most extreme situations. Suppose that you were told you have a nasty form of cancer. How will you interpret this? Some alternative interpretations are, I won't let this beat me. This is the end. This is God's punishment for my wickedness. If I'm a good patient, the doctors will save me. Conventional medicine is useless. And so on. Anyone who says there is no alternative has merely rejected all the other choices. Interpretations are choices. A friend who had a Catholic upbringing and so saw herself, her life and her world as an unchangeable part of the absolute eternal truths of the Catholic Church told me that the best thing she got from therapy was learning that she had choices. You can always change your choice. You might initially interpret your illness as, this is God's punishment for my wickedness, but later think, that's silly, and decide upon, I won't let this beat me. Having made one interpretation, you then interpret your interpretation. Interpreting your illness as God's punishment might lead you to further interpretations such as, I deserve this punishment, or I must be good and accept my punishment and not do anything to get better. Deciding that your illness is a challenge to be mastered might lead you to interpret this as, I'll do anything I can to get better, or I'll get on with my life as normal. Life has many paradoxes. A paradox is not a problem. A problem is a question, which in theory at least is capable of being answered. A paradox is a seeming contradiction which nevertheless contains an element of a truth. A paradox of life. Even though we can never know reality directly, to survive and flourish we must always strive to make interpretations that are as close to reality as possible. For instance, suppose you're about to cross a busy road. You can't possibly know the exact speed of approaching traffic, but to cross the road safely you must judge the speed of the traffic as accurately as possible. How do you make this judgement? Suppose a friend who is a very successful stockbroker advises you to put your savings in shares that, he says, are sure to increase in value. How do you judge the likelihood that what he says is true? We create new interpretations out of the interpretations we have already acquired. We have nothing else to use. We might decide not to bother with sorting through these old interpretations to create something new and just run out onto the road or impulsively give our money to the stockbroker. Or we might think carefully about our past experiences, contrasting one with another and compare our past interpretations with our present observations, to be as sure as we can that our new interpretation is as good an interpretation of reality as it can be. We can compare the speeds of a number of passing cars or do some research about current stock prices. Although we might know about many alternative ways of interpreting some aspect of reality, we each can have our own favourite way of interpreting that aspect. However, 
Our favourite ways of creating our interpretations can result in interpretations which are far from reality. For instance, we all know that envelopes come in many sizes and colours. Some people, however, when inspecting their mail, see and open white and coloured envelopes, but never see, much less open, brown envelopes. Yet unpaid bills don't disappear into thin air. We need to be aware how one group of our wishes can dominate all our interpretations. We can choose to see only what we wish to see, and thus do only what we wish to do. However, our wishes might not be an accurate reflection of reality, particularly that part of reality which is composed of other people's interpretations. We forget that other people see things differently from us. You must have noticed that no two people ever interpret an event in exactly the same way. You interpret a television programme as being excellent. Your friend thinks it's rubbish. This is not a matter of other people being mad, bad or awkward. It's an inescapable part of the way we are physically constituted. Each of us, every moment of our lives, asleep or awake, is engaged in interpreting what is happening. Each of us has only one source we can draw on in creating our interpretations. This is our past experience. No two people ever have the same past experience. Identical twins might begin life with the same genetic components, but life in the womb differs for each one of them. One is born after the other, and from the moment they are born, they have different experiences. To the extent that two people create similar interpretations, they can communicate. But even when two people speak the same language, they create very different interpretations. Thus, two people can live side by side, speak the same language, yet interpret the world in totally different ways. It's often said, for instance, that men and women inhabit different planets. So here we are, each of us in our own little world of interpretations, yet at the same time we are born social animals. We are physically constituted as social animals. When you were born you didn't just search around for a food bearing nipple, you searched for a friendly face. You were born knowing how to recognise a face and preferring to look at a face than at anything else. If a friendly face hadn't turned up for you to talk to, you wouldn't be reading this now. Without a friendly face, even if you'd been adequately fed and kept warm, you would have either died in the first few weeks, it's a condition known as anaclytic depression, or you would have gone on to become one of those strange individuals who are unable to see people as being in any way different from other objects. Out of the bond we develop with a mothering person in our own first months of life grows our sense of right and wrong, guilt and reparation. Babies who don't get the chance to develop this bond grow up to be conscienceless people. They might lead apparently quite ordinary lives, whether criminals or company directors, but their personal relationships are always a disaster. A paradox of life. We are each a unique individual living our own individual, self-created world. Yet we need one another in order to survive. The interpretations we create don't just exist on their own. They arrive out of the set of interpretations we've created in the past. And they also determine how we think, feel and act. Whatever we think, feel and do has endless consequences. This is another aspect of life which we cannot change. It has to do with the nature of reality. Whatever reality is, it does seem that it is a vast, ever-changing interconnectedness. Everything is constantly moving and everything is connected to everything else. Physicists say this and so did the ancient Hindu, Taoist and Buddhist philosophers. Because everything is connected to everything else. All our acts have consequences. Don't kid yourself that what you do will have no consequences or very limited consequences 
or that you can decide what the consequences will be. A father might say, I caught my son stealing, I gave him a good hiding, and that was the end of it. But he is deluding himself. The father's actions will have consequences beyond the father's control as a result of how the son interprets what his father has done. Everything you do has consequences, and these consequences spread in all directions and go on forever. A paradox of life. Everything that happens has good consequences and bad consequences. For instance, you win the lottery. Good consequences. You give up working and plan a round-the-world luxury voyage. Bad consequences. Your entire family comes too. Remember that good and bad are not absolute and eternal judgments existing outside our human life. We each have our own interpretation of good and bad. Some people believe that lotteries are wicked. Some people wouldn't want to go anywhere without their family. A paradox of life. Every interpretation we can create has good and bad implications. Suppose your interpretation of the right way to behave includes the belief that you will always tell the truth. The good implication of this is that people will always know where they are with you. And the bad implication is that people are sometimes hurt by what you say. Because every interpretation has good implications and bad implications, every action has good consequences and bad consequences. Life can never be perfect. The longing for perfection is the longing for an illusion. If you want to be miserable, believe that you and the world ought to be perfect. You will always feel guilty, angry and disappointed. If you want to be miserable, don't try to make your interpretations as close to reality as possible. You will always feel surprised, confused and fearful. If you want to be miserable, believe that you, your life and the world are reality, fixtures you cannot change. You will always feel trapped and hopeless. If you are miserable and want to change, say to yourself, the way I interpret myself, my life and my world has implications and consequences which make me miserable. What alternative interpretations can I discover for what has happened? is happening and will happen to me. Which of those interpretations will give me the most satisfaction and happiness? Let's look at the most important components of myself, my life and my world. I think that's quite an interesting start to a book. It's really laying out her stall. Um, I think that what she does very well without saying it's PCP is say the the core parts of PCP, which is that reality exists, but our response to it is based on the meanings we attribute to our experiences. But none of us have a better understanding of reality than anybody else. The reality is our own, and we can have shared views of reality with others. And she goes on to talk about that in the book. Or you can have your own very unique view. Uh, which isn't shared by anybody else. She really talks about the fact that what Kelly said was there is a reality out there, but each of us interprets in our own way, so no one person knows what it is. And what we're working with is our ways of making sense of our experiences, and that's what she calls the creating meaning. And we do that right from the beginning of our life. So, you know, even before birth, we're doing something. I think she's very direct in the way she addresses people. So she says very clearly, it's up to you how you interpret things. But if you're interpreting things in a way that makes you miserable, there is the possibility of change. And you can change the way you see things. So she's very certain of that, which I think is helpful, uh, and I would agree with it. doesn't mean that there won't be pain and suffering and horrors and people won't have had awful experiences. It's not like that. It's not that 
you can say that somebody who's been, let's say, uh, punched in the face by somebody will not interpret that in a way that makes it okay for them. So our past experience leads to the meaning that we create for ourselves to make sense of our present experience and to anticipate our future experiences. I would really recommend this book and I might read some other chapters to you in the future if you think it's been a good idea. And I think it's quite nice in the way that she tackles a number of different subjects. So if you found it either interesting or helpful, if you let me know, I might do another one. If I don't hear anything from anyone, I'll probably think "Mm, maybe that wasn't the right thing to do. Okay, so that's all for today. And I'll talk to you again at the end of March. Bye. Thank you.